there's just so many scripts to read and not enough time. But you know what? We've got a lot of time to talk about some scripts today. Welcome to the 14th annual Screenwriting Nominees Q&A. Howdy, I'm Jeff Goldsmith, and this is the Q&A. My agenda is simple. Each week, I plan to bring you in-depth insight into the creative process of storytelling. Folks, we have an absolutely amazing panel for you today. And as the pandemic is still on, this was done as two Zooms. And that's the way it's been for the 13th and 14th Q&As. And before that, we would just fill a theater and do it live in front of an audience, which I truly miss. But you know what? I'm still really happy with this Q&A because it turned out great as these panelists are great. So let's get into it. So to understand the panelists, you need to understand how this worked. It was done as three different Zooms. First, we did a group Zoom, but two of our panelists were not present for it. They were actually in different time zones. So we went and we were able to do separate Zooms with them asking the exact same questions. And I got to say, I'm really happy about how it cut in. So here's the lineup, folks, for our two Zoom in panelists. It actually happens to be the first two films because we are going alphabetically by film. So first up, we have Belfast writer-director Sir Kenneth Branagh. Next is Drive My Car writer-director Ryosuke Hamaguchi. And if you've watched our previous podcast, you'll know that Mr. Hamaguchi is speaking Japanese through a translator. And we leave the first few seconds of what he has to say in because we want you to hear the filmmaker's voice, but then we immediately cut to the translator. And then in our group chat, we have Dune co-writer John Spates. King Richard writer Zach Balin, The Power of the Dog writer-director Jane Campion, and last but not least, The Worst Person in the World co-writer Eskel Vogt. Now, you know, in many of the previous years of our live panel, we did this at the Los Angeles Film School, and we would sell out the theater and do things in front of everybody live. And it was a blast, and I miss them. I miss going back. We haven't been back yet at a screening or anything else but they were able to help us out today behind the scenes of our group chat Zoom by kind of moderating, uh, you know, highlighting the people that needed to be highlighted when they were speaking. So thanks to the Los Angeles Film School for staying with this panel. I miss being in your theater and hopefully we'll be back soon. Of course, thanks to all the studio publicists and the personal publicists who made this panel possible because folks, this is not easy to coordinate. And they did a fantastic job of making this panel happen. So thanks again to all the great publicists out there. And of course, I'm really happy to thank today's sponsors of Coverfly.com and Final Draft for being so great over all the years. And I hope you will check out their sites. Of course, it all starts with a screenplay and FinalDraft.com is where you could download the world's premier screenwriting software. Final Draft is used by Oscar and Emmy nominees and winners alike. And of course, film and television writers as well. It is the premier screenwriting software in the world. And their latest release, is Final Draft 12. And if you haven't yet bought it or upgraded to it, I have an amazing discount coupon code for you that will save you 40% of your purchase or your upgrade of Final Draft 12 over at finaldraft.com. When you're in your shopping cart, just use coupon code QAPOD22. That's QAPOD22. And that will save you 40% off your purchase or upgrade of Final Draft 12. Now, of course, once you have that script written, you still need to do something with it. So I hope you go on over to Coverfly.com. If you're a screenwriter who's looking to get their script out there, I hope you'll go on over to Coverfly.com because they curate the best screenwriting talent discovery programs all in one place. At Coverfly.com, you could submit your scripts to writing fellowships, labs, competitions, and festivals, and you could track the status of your submission all through your Coverfly dashboard. Coverfly is also a great resource to connect scripts and writers to industry professionals. To date, hundreds of writers have found their agents or managers at Coverfly.com and went on to write for studios such as Universal, Netflix, CBS, Amazon, and Blumhouse. If you're an emerging screenwriter with a finished script, check out Coverfly.com today. And while you're surfing around online, I hope you check out Backstory Magazine as well. We just released our Oscar issue, issue number 46. That's right, kids. If you want to read any of these nominated Oscar screenplays, you could read them inside of our magazine. And very often you could read articles that have interviews that are different from the questions that we use in today's podcast with the screenwriters as well. As you know, you could read Backstory on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app. 
backstory. And if you've never read us before, you could test drive us by reading our free issue. And if you like what you see and you want to subscribe, and I hope you do, you could use discount coupon code SAVE5. That'll save you $5 off a one-year subscription to Backstory Magazine. Look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page support my passion project. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. But now, without any further ado, let's jump right into our 14th annual Screenwriting Nominees Q&A as I introduced our esteemed panelists. It's great to see you all. Thanks for joining us today. We are going to go alphabetically by film. So first up, we have Belfast writer-director Sir Kenneth Branagh. Next is Drive My Car writer-director Ryosuke Hamaguchi. And then in our group chat, we have Dune co-writer John Spates. We have Zach Balin from King Richard. We have Jane Campion from Power of the Dog. And we have Eskel Fucht from Worst Person in the World. So here's some interesting facts about this group. You represent six of the 10 Oscar-nominated screenplays. So congrats on that. Kudos to each of you. And in today's group, not only did three of you write your screenplays, but you also directed them. And that would include Sir Kenneth Branagh, Mr. Hamaguchi, and Jane Campion. And speaking of Ken and Jane, this marks your second Oscar nomination for screenwriting. For Ken, your first was in 1990 for Henry V. And for Jane, your first was in 1993 for The Piano. And you won the Oscar for writing The Piano. So kudos to both of you on this, your second Oscar nomination for screenwriting. And uh, for the rest of this fine group, it marks your first Oscar nomination for screenwriting, which is fantastic. So kudos to you on that. One other thing to point out for Zach, this is your first Oscar nomination on your first produced screenplay. So it's just all easy street from here. Just write a script a year. You'll get an Oscar nomination a year. You are, you're set. Yeah. Piece of cake. Piece of cake. Piece of cake. So on that high note, I want to take you all off your pretty pedestals and kind of remind people that you are all real people as well. So what was your darkest moment as a screenwriter, either on this project or in your career at a time when you thought that what you were working on wasn't going to move forward? And then how did you find the inspiration or the gumption to continue on? Ken, your answer. I think that one of the things that you learn to understand about the so-called dark moments is that they are the necessary yin and yang of um, the creative process. And a breakthrough occurs when, as it says in a, in a meditation that I use myself, uh, you understand that you can welcome what they call the disturbances. Welcome the disturbances. They're the, that's how you test yourself. That's how you measure how far you've come in terms of being able to keep breathing and keep putting one foot in front of another when things are difficult. As they also say, suffering is resistance to what is. Uh, so when you have, you know, I, I've had, frankly, numerous occasions when I've been either badly reviewed or when you do a performance as an actor that sometimes you you are you feel as though you might have made some breakthrough with, but in fact, people feel quite the opposite. So sometimes the dark moments are the ones where you may think that you are sort of out of touch, out of sync um, with um, the way other people may regard your work. But it's at times like that when I think you can get a terrific amount of insight by painfully perhaps putting yourself in those other people's shoes and, um, and accepting sometimes that, um, that the, they for sure have a point, but then trying to understand whether even while you respect that, whether you go, well, you know, I just happened to walk to the beat of this different drum um, and uh, and I can either embrace that or I can amend it or, you know, I think for me, the best dark nights of the soul, as it were, are when uh, you think you are lost but you discover that the greatest possibility for advancement occurs at the greatest point of negativity. Uh, so I remember one summer of 2000 waking up in the Essex House Hotel in New York, and there was a review for our film musical of Shakespeare's Love's Labour's Lost, uh, which was poor and which more or less guaranteed that this, in any case, fairly insular art house movie was probably not going to have much of a life. I remember that being a very sort of 
personally desolate kind of moment. Um, but I think what it did is it helped kind of wipe a slate clean. It wasn't very personally very comfortable, but it was, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it was neither here nor there. You make a piece of work, somebody didn't like it. But it was uh, it was a particularly a sort of big swing at the fences, I guess, from, from me, and uh, it didn't work. And I think uh, you have to accept that, and accepting it, um, it had, gives you some painful truths. But I found... Otherwise, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you, Jeff. The, that um, that the you those those blows or those wounds or those trips. You know, we all stumble. We're all blind. Um, are the ones cliche though it sounds from which you uh, you learn the most. So I've tried to at least intellectually and sometimes even actually uh, welcome the disturbances. I've always been a fan of the bard. So you know, without a doubt, I would rather see somebody swing for the fences. Then do something safe. Mr. Hamaguchi, your answer. In terms of the, the darkest moments in my life, I think it was in my 20s. I had just graduated university and I started working as an assistant director in the Japanese film industry. And that's when I learned that I am uh, talentless at being an assistant director. I didn't really know how to communicate with people, how to act within this environment. Um, and so I essentially got kicked out of the commercial filmmaking world in Japan and uh, being told that I was unnecessary. And that was a very tough experience for me to realize that I could not assistant direct. Um, but that actually also led me to go, you know what, I'm just going to concentrate on being a director. And so then I went to, they had just established a public film school. And so I, re I applied myself to there and kind of restarted my career then. That is fascinating. I'm glad you kept going, obviously. Okay, John. As a feature film screenwriter for hire, um, I face the the inevitability that all working screenwriters face, uh, which is that we are fungible on a film project in a way that other key players are not. And it's not uncommon for writers to be replaced or fired. And often it's not personal. There's just somebody else who wants to work on the movie. Sometimes it is personal. Um, but one way or another, uh, we ride a carousel that not everybody on a film rides. And we're well compensated for it. And it's an excellent career and an excellent living. But I think all screenwriters need to grow armor about that odd aspect of the career, that you're likely to be moved along even in success. And you can write a script that gets a film into production and you guess you showered with compliments. And then they say, but we want to bring on so-and-so to do a few touches. And so you get moved along. And so the darkest, ah, oh, this was a great experience. Like those moments of darkness didn't come. The hardest hours on Dune were in the process of cracking the adaptation the first time through. Um, when I began, I sat down with the novel and I tore it to pieces with a red pen and dog-eared pages and annotated and abused my physical book in a way that I never do in any other context and produced an adaptation from this extremely dense and sprawling sci-fi work. And there were times when it felt it wouldn't fit. Times when it, it really just getting that monstrous edifice into the narrow bracket that is a feature film, even an epic feature film of two and a half hours, is vastly smaller than any novel, and certainly vastly smaller than this huge, dense world-building novel. So yeah, it was the process of constant excision and surgery to throw away everything inessential until you had come to something that could be represented on screen and tell an integral story hang together and make sense without ever drowning people in lore and the minutiae of the science fiction universe. Um, and the cutting, it seemed, would never stop. And there were times when I wasn't sure when, that what would left would still stand. Now for Zach. I mean, mo most of my career was dark up, and, <laughs> up until this. But, um, you know, during this movie, we some of it was during production. We, you know, we shot three weeks. We had, I think we began shooting, you know, February of twenty. 20 and you know shut down on march whenever that was you know when tom hanks got covid and and it was you know we were we were down for seven months and we were shooting with children who were aging rapidly during during that time so i think that that was always feel, felt really precarious whether or not we were going to be able to come back in the time where we weren't going to have to like irishman the kids back to the ages that they needed to be in the movie but then, you know, throughout the the writing process, for me, the the honestly, the writing on this was was really 
joyous and it was a really fun experience to write it. But there were a lot of hurdles with the getting the family's involvement, getting the script to them that we knew even when when Will became interested in the in the project that we had a lot of momentum behind it. But the, all of the studios were still, you know, their interest was all contingent on whether or not we were going to be able to get the family to at least endorse our version, you know, our, the, the project as a whole. And right. that took a really long time and, and did not, there were a lot of emails between myself and Tim and Trevor, like the producers saying like, you know, have you heard from Isha? Have you heard from Venus and Serena? And they would, there were long periods of no contact where even though it felt like we, we had made a good relationship, we were, get, we were getting things going that it just was not going to happen. So those were probably the, the scariest times, I'd say. Jane, for you. You know, I'd, I'd love to share a really dark moment for myself um, as a learner writer. <laughs> of course. Um, Any dark moment you want. I just want yeah, people to know it's never easy. I can remember like I'd finished art school and I was really, really keen to, to become a filmmaker. I loved it. I didn't know anybody in the industry whatsoever, but I had started making films at art school and I really, really wanted to. To, you know, I discovered the thing that just totally energized me in my life and I really wanted to do it. And I decided to write a, um, a short film and get funding for it from the Australian Film Commission. And I wrote the script about this um, family uh, and it was, it was pretty weird and out there. And um, I remember it was half an hour and I remember finishing it and I felt this incredible sense of, you know, mastery and achievement and I read it through and just thought, this is so effing brilliant. I am, I am the, the dope, you know, I, this is incredible. And I, and I walked around and I went to the shop and celebrated with a juice or something, you know, and couldn't, couldn't believe myself. And then the next day, um, exactly the next day, thinking like I'd like to relive this great experience. I reread the script and I had the absolute opposite experience. I thought it was the most sucky, disgusting piece of crap I had ever read in my entire life. And I was going like, what's right? Which is right? <laughs> you know, this is such a difficult experience. I'm so deluded. You know, I don't know. I thought it was great. Now I think it absolutely sucks. And um, I just felt so completely confused about this sort of pull and push of like, you're great, you're, you're, you're disgusting. Um, and, you know, how, how it would figure in my life as a writer. Uh, it was really, really, really confronting. And I, I now can handle it. I don't have those extremes anymore. Would you say it was a case of self self doubt or imposter syndrome? <laughs> self doubt would be a sweet way of calling it. I thought it's like self loathing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't know if other people have it to the extreme that I do. I mean, in some ways, I think it's a superpower because it really makes you able to see the opposite of what you think as well. But you know, now I I've found that much more happy middle ground where you know I'm not going to go like it's the or and I don't go it's the worst it's like oh maybe it needs a little bit more work but like to be in that fulcrum and really not know the truth I mean I'd love to hear from the other writers if they have that experience too I mean being able to trust your instincts is important as a writer so what instincts day one's instincts or day two's instincts you know like it was completely (laughs) schizophrenic but with the power of the dog, I think the thing that really scared me the most when it was a dark day, but I had a, I had a lot of fear about the fact that the, the property, um, the novel had been optioned five times before and nobody had successfully turned it into a film or even got a screenplay as far as we know out of it that anybody liked. And that really gave me some pause for thought. I mean, I, I really did think a long time about what it could be that you know, could be so very difficult about this book. You know, was it going to be one of those impossible missions? It made me think really hard about how I was going to approach that adaptation. I'm glad you did approach it because <laughs> I love your film. Thank uh, you so much. Eskel, we're, we're going to go to you. Well, I, I'd just like to comment on what uh, Jane Campion said, that uh, I think most writers really recognize that feeling of, of like schizophrenia, that the one day you're like, oh, this is great. 
and well, I'm the I'm the best writer in the world, and the next day I'm the worst. I mean, you just feel ashamed of what you manage to to put down on on paper. I, I think being a writer is learning to deal with that that you have to uh, go through those kinds of waves of uh, self-loathing and self-congratulation. Uh, but uh, I think on The Worst Person in the World, I, I had a great time. I didn't have a worst moment, except for the moments when you think, oh, maybe this is going to happen because of COVID or because uh, my co-writers, also the director, when he, he managed to, to mess up his knee in a skiing accident suddenly and it was like can he walk again and he was also the director and my best friend so that was a dark moment but um, sure. I'd like to uh, go a bit back to uh, to my first feature that I wrote that was also with Joachim Trier my my, my co-writer and the director worst person in the world he was my best friend and I was like Jane I, I very early I wanted to make movies I love movies I thought that would be the best thing to do but I wasn't from a filmmaking background where there's no way to get into the business. So I just thought, well, I can write stuff. No one can stop me from writing stuff. I mean, I can't get hold of a camera or actors or, or whatever, or a budget, but I can write stuff. So I had that in me. And then suddenly I met Joachim Trier when I was in my teens and he shared my dream of making movies. And we shared my love of movies and we became like instant best friends, like you can be in your teens. And, uh, and he was from a filmmaking family. His mother had made documentaries. His father was a sound engineer. I mean, he had, I mean, suddenly everything, just sharing the dream already made it feel more real. And we started making short films together and that went quite well. Uh, I directed some, I, I worked on his, he worked on mine. I mean, we did uh, everything together and then suddenly, oh, we're gonna make a feature. And we were so tired of making short films and we thought, oh, everything will fit into a feature. I mean, it's a feature film. We can put all our ideas into this one. And we tried to write the first uh, feature film reprise and it took a long time. And uh, we just did it on spec. We did it for ourselves. We just felt like this is a personal thing, a personal story. That's how we work. And and we we couldn't make it work i mean i remember the darkest moments maybe after a couple of years working on it and we just read it and no it it doesn't work should we just should we just throw it away and it felt like that moment you're like if we don't uh, manage to do this we have no place in this this business or this art form and we, we we aren't good enough and and then we just had that moment and we said We'll give it another shot. <laughs> and we worked on it. Uh, and really from uh, like a page one rewrite. And it was a story about friendship of two people who, who shared that dream of becoming something that was very personal to us. And we, we managed to pull it off and, and make that movie. But uh, it was like that moment where we think maybe, maybe this is not for us. Maybe we're not cut out for this. Well, I'm, I'm clearly glad you kept going. And, uh, you know, self-doubt and imposter syndrome affects everybody. So it's it's interesting to hear, even from Oscar nominees, it's it's still somewhere in the back of your mind. But yeah, eventually- I, I, we're Scandinavians. We have a lot of that. You know, we, we, <laughs> we, we're very good at criticizing ourselves. That's our superpower in Scandinavia. Well, so, OK, we're going to leave that darkness behind us. We're just going to go for a lightning question. Just first thing that comes to your mind, something easy. Tell us a film, a book, a script, a piece of music. Something that always inspires you, a place that you like to go for inspiration. It's just always a great way for artists to share works that inspire them. So since we're going to go in reverse chronological order, Eskel, we'll be starting with you. I always listen to music while I write. I mean, constantly. I think it's just, again, it's the Scandinavian modesty. I, I really need music to make me dare to write something that takes risks. I, I, so I just play that constantly. That changes from, from film to film, from project to project. So, But uh, there was this one book that was strangely inspiring for a long time. It was uh, by a French author called uh, Marcel Cohen. And it was called Self-Portrait of a Reader. And it had like the most amazing quotes from literature. So I remember just when you're stuck on something, I would just take that book. And then it was this amazing quote from Virginia Woolf on that page. Or I go to another one and it was Edmond Jabez who had a, like this wonderful philosophical thing or that. It was just an amazing thing to have lying on your desk. So I'll, I'll go for that one. It was, uh, it was a huge inspiration for a while. Jane. 
something that's inspiring for you, a place that you like to go, film, book, piece of music? Well, I like to go to the purest of the arts, which is poetry, I think, and I guess music too, but that's not my thing so much as art. So for this project, um, I became really enamoured with Lucy and Freud's portraiture. He's one of the great um, warts and all, beautiful, show it, naked, the human condition. And he's not about glorifying it, but he's about going inside it to unashamedly really feel it. And um, it, it really strengthened me. And there was one particular portrait that I felt looked really like my idea of Phil Burbank, and I put it on my wall. And also I really loved uh, reading Annie Prue's books about the West. Um, she wrote the afterward to the novel by Thomas Savage, Power of the Dog, and um, she wrote this one particular story called Tits Up in a Ditch, which I think is the best short story I've ever read. And it's, it's not set in the same time as um, Power of the Dog, which is 1925. There's just something about the incredible cruelty of the world but also the loving attention to it at the same time and the, the, the difficulty, the pain, the courage and the poetry of these people struggling poor, you know, in these um, Western towns that really, uh, really move me. And that's one of the things I always feel like, that every person is a poem and that when you write a character, you are trying to find their poetry in, in a way. That's great. I, I'm going to search out that story because it sounds fantastic. Zach, something that inspires yeah. you. I mean, I think like like everyone else here, I think it's dependent on which projects I'm working on. You know, I, I certainly have like a handful of movies that I go back to all the time. You know, that if I'm just, just it, taking a break, I, I watch Badlands all the time. I watch, I, I really love Boogie Nights, which like totally different tones. Um, but, you know, if I'm just, if I'm stuck or I, or I need need to find take a moment and kind of refresh. I usually, I go back to some of those things or I go back to, you know, I, I constantly am reading other people's scripts. So, you know, I'll go back and I read Paul's scripts or I'll read, you know, I, I really love Tony Gilroy, Scott Frank, and some of the guys like that. And so I, I do a lot of just, just kind of reading of other people I really respect and try to get back into the flow of things. And then for me, honestly, I, 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 I try to get out a lot. I like, I go for a run, I go play tennis or try to do something physical to sort of get myself out of a locked space of just circling an idea that won't come out somehow. And then you know, I, I sort of find that getting away from it can be very helpful for me. Great. John? I'd say something uh, similar. We have built for ourselves a world of perpetual stimulation. And it's very easy to end up because you know the instrument of our craft puts a screen in front of us most of the time. You know, I think there's a lot to be said for working on paper for as long as you possibly can in order not to have those bells and whistles and pings selling you alternative activities all the time, the news cycle, your friends, everything. But for that reason, there are times when I just need the still point. I don't have the luxury of being bored much anymore. I'm very busy professionally. I've got a son. I've got responsibilities. There's always something to do. But boredom is the engine of creativity. It is the the pollen of the muse. And there are times when I just need to be in a place where there is nothing to do. And I'm lucky enough to live close enough to the water on the west side here that I can get on a bike or put my car on the road and just head to the beach and sit down on a gray day when there's nobody around and listen to the ocean. And in 25 minutes of just doing nothing and watching seagulls float around, I'll feel my brain change modes. It's like I drop to a more base state and my inner child starts daydreaming again and just ideas begin to flow. But what I need is to get away from input and get to a place where there's only white noise and in white noise, your brain begins to make things. That's a great piece of advice. And now, Mr. Hamaguchi, your answer. まあ、モチベーションがなくなるっていうことが、まあ、なんか自分はそんなに上がり下がりがないので。You know, I don't necessarily have a lot of ups and downs when it comes to being motivated or inspired necessarily.、Uh, but when I do find that I'm having a tough time moving forward when I'm working,、um, I listen to music. And I specifically listen to this Japanese band called Spitz.、Um, and I've found that in listening to them, my script writing moves forward and I find more efficiency when I'm working. What's your favorite album by them? Oh, Spitz. 
、えー、蜂蜜。<laughs> 蜂蜜 which means honey. Yeah, I'm going to look it up. That sounds awesome. <laughs> And finally, Mr. Brana. There's a, an album of music, an LP record by a, a British singer called Julie Covington.、Uh, Julie Covington recorded on the original pre show soundtrack album. Uh, the role of Evita for Andrew Lloyd Webber.、Um, uh, so she was the first one to sing and record Don't Cry for Me, Argentina. She has an amazingly soulful, very English voice. And so she always sings in an English sound. So when she sings I, I, a song like I Can't Dance, it, she does say dance rather than dance. She just chooses to be in her own. Uh, um, sound a bit like、uh, a predecessor, Petula Clark, another singer I really like. The,、uh, this album of Julie Covington's, just called by the same name, is from the early 70s. She was also at the time a,、uh, a, an actress in a television program called Rock Follies about a female rock group. And she was the sort of rebellious lead singer. In this album, there's a Kurt Vile song, there's a song by John Lennon, song by Steve Winwood, song by Kate Bush. It's a lot of、um, her own responses to、uh, contemporary British artists.、Uh, it's soulful, melancholic, and there's something about her voice. I respond very strongly to individual human voices. So when I return to the voice of Julie Covington on that album, It always lifts me. And, you know, like the great musicians and the great singers, it always seems that they have a voice which is in itself across one song, a five act drama. So I go back there. She has a smile in her voice. She has the tragic quality in her voice sometimes. So, and, and that particular group of songs, some of which are very, very light indeed and poppy, is a real tonic. That's great. You've all been Oscar nominated. Did something feel different when you sat down to write this script? You're all very passionate about these stories. I'm curious if something actually felt different when you wrote this script that received an Oscar nomination, or did it seem like it was, it was you know, just another job that you were really passionate about and something that you loved? Okay, Ken, and going back down the line, starting with you. Interesting question. I think there was a must do quality to this. There was a confluence of influences. The,、um, the time unusually、uh, allowed by the beginning of the pandemic and the lockdown. For a focus that、um, I might not otherwise have had,、um, a sense that the material of the story was being activated by the life we were living.、Uh, COVID was making the future very uncertain, and it reminded me so strongly of the uncertainty of my life in Belfast once the violence began in August of 1969. And then I think there was a long held desire to, through the medium of a story, Which would have a plot and would have characters and would have a beginning, a middle, and an end, but it would also be a way of returning to my creative DNA、um, and indeed my actual DNA,、right. which、uh, across decades of privileged work in, in entertainment has people, for what it's worth, probably thinking about me as someone quite different. Whereas the boy that's revealed in Belfast from a working class North Belfast. Family watching popular movies,、uh, not、um, from a, an upper class family in England、um, going to Shakespeare. I think the investigation in my own mind, my own creative life about exactly where the journey that I have been on started was part of this necessity. So the screenplay was driven by a sort of have to. As a result, the discipline required for it came. Very simply, not always easily, but simply. And for me, the simple drive that I decided went with these other factors was that every morning by 9 a.m. in my shed in the garden, I should be writing. And I really made it a sort of rather sweaty pressure to make sure that I was typing by 9 a.m. And so I did every trick in the book to try and make sure that happened. Sometimes they were a little feeble, but、um, I, usually the one of Not finishing the last sentence you could have finished the, the, at the end of the previous session, so that you, you kind of know what you're going to say in the beginning of the first one, even if you don't know exactly what's coming immediately after it. And I found that across seven, eight weeks, I'd work from nine till 1 p.m., and then I wouldn't look at it again in the rest of the day. But I did, and I didn't particularly have a page count in mind. But just that I would stay there. Often it's a lot of staring at the page, but a lot of it was trying to tap into 
intuition. And uh, although I had laid out a structure for it, I wanted inside that to be pretty free. So sometimes I would wait until the muse visited. But inside that, in the same way as the screenplay arc was structured, the time was also structured. So I just knew that for me, for this particular project, I needed to open the floodgates and they had to open by nine o'clock every morning. Mr. Hamaguchi, now to you. あの今までとはなんか全然違う感覚はありました。これは村上春樹さんの原作をやってるっていうことがやっぱりすごく。I actually felt very differently when I was writing this screenplay. I think it has a lot to do with the fact that the original story was written by Haruki Murakami. The characters that appear almost feel like characters that shouldn't necessarily exist, but still do exist, and you can believe that they exist. And working with characters like that actually led Me to do more writing. And it felt like while I was writing, I was writing with some wings.、Um, and I really think that it's all thanks to、um, the fact that it is originally a Haruki Murakami story. John, now to you. There's a way in which it's surprising, even to me, how much all of it feels the same. Meaning that writing an original story is this very personal, generative act. And you'd think that adapting another work would be some different thing where you're a vessel for someone else's creativity. But the only way to write a good adaptation is to just consume that source material like, like a bacterium and metabolize it and make it part of you. And, and then you write and you're telling your story like you would doing any other thing. Likewise, if someone's pitched you an idea and said, write this thing for me, and that becomes your job, the only way to do it well is to. Engulf it to become it to make it yours and then write, and it all feels the same. It's all just spinning a yarn. But that said, sitting down on Dune, I knew that I was adapting one of the most revered works of science fiction that has outlasted almost all of its contemporaries as a landmark piece. It is still read, it's widely translated, it has a fan base of countless millions. And I knew that my director was Denis Villeneuve, who is one of the working greats. So, in that way, I knew that I was walking on hallowed ground and very lucky to be where I was. Zach? Yeah, I mean, I think I did feel like this one was different. Not that what I was going to output or what I was going to put down on the page was, you know, that I had some innate confidence that this one was going to be better than the other ones, but that when I came involved with the project, I knew that Richard was a really special character that I maybe like had not found before in my other scripts, and that he just he was so complicated and multi dimensional and had a, such an outrageous personality. He really traversed this really wide range of emotions and, and ideas and behaviors, and, and that all of those things were, just felt like this is. This is the kind of character that I'd been searching for for a really long time. And, and so I knew that that had the potential to be really compelling and, and dramatic. I was aware of that from, from the outset. And then, you know, for me, it was just sort of then trying to find what's the canvas that I can put him in? You know, what, what sort of part of his life could we focus on where he was going to be able to exploit all of those different dimensions of who he was? But yeah, I think I felt like this had the potential to be, to be special in a way that some other ones didn't. Jane. Yeah, well, I've worked on a lot of different stories, and you know, you'd have to be a fool to think that they were going to be Academy candidates. <laughs>、um, for example, Sweetie, my first one. You don't write to get an Academy nomination, you write because you can't avoid this particular idea. I think it's like got you somehow, and your, your psyche has gripped it, and you basically have to do it because that's where your power comes from. When you obey your psyche, when, when you're in harmony with the deeper forces that energize you,、um, you can't write for approval. It's,、uh, it's a killer. So I think with this particular story, I had the sense that it had some, let's say, more winning qualities <laughs> with audiences because it has, you know, it's full of secrets. And different levels of secrets and mysteries. And, you know, the, the clever thing that he did in the fictionalizing of his autobiographical story was to hide the greatest mystery, which was the murder mystery, inside all these secrets. So it just slipped past you and, you know, you, you couldn't see it. And I mean, I remember when I read it, I went, did I read that right? And I just had to go back through the book to sort of. Check that I understood everything because it was so subtle and, and interesting. And then I think I also found myself very much affected by the themes in the story. Like, with it, you know, I hadn't thought about, oh, I'm going to make this. I just kept, let's say, being haunted by the story, by the book, by the themes, by you know, the way that 
how subversive in a way his approach to the West, you know, a man who actually did grow up there in 1925. And, you know, he peeled that onion of rancher masculinity and underneath he found some, you know, something very vulnerable, something very sad and, you know, full of yearning and grief. I thought all these qualities gave it a unique depth. And, you know, I didn't know whether that would kick us off into an area which was like strictly art house, you know, or that the murder mystery aspect of the story would, you know, that propulsion of it would invite more viewers in. But, you know, I thought it was a great piece of material because, you know, potentially it had both aspects, you know, to bring complexity to was kind of a mystery story. That makes sense. Esco? Well, uh, yes and no. When uh, I started to write this, uh, I I write with uh, Joachim Trier, uh, who's also the director, but we work in the same way every time. It's just we just sit down together and we start talking and we don't really know what the next movie will be. We'll bring some ideas, we'll discuss, we'll discuss films, we'll discuss our lives, we'll discuss anything and just slowly a film comes out of that and uh, and I'm very happy when some people say when they see a worst person in the world it feels like having a conversation with uh, a good friend I didn't know I had which I felt is uh, like very true to our writing process we wanted to be intimate in a way and personal and when we write we really close the door of the writing room and don't care what people think you know we just feel okay we want to talk about relationships. We want to talk about love, maybe be inspired by great romantic comedies. But at the same time, we are melancholic uh, Scandinavians who are very prone to asking existential questions. So, so the movie will change in tone and character. And we just feel that if that feels right to us, then hopefully someone out there also will. Uh, like it, you know, and uh, we just keep working like that and working on it and working on it until we have a first draft. And then that's the moment of opening the the door to the writing room and showing it to people. And usually I get very anxious then, you know, Uh, but when I reread it just before sending it out, I I think even more than our uh, earlier movies, this is the fifth one we've written together. And I've written a few other movies for myself to direct as well. And, And so this was maybe the seventh or eighth script I read and I read it and I felt this really has something you know it, it, you know I do feel I mean for us as Scandinavian we don't used to bragging about ourselves but uh, but I just felt a bit more confident than I'm uh, I was used to because I felt uh, I mean oh, we're going to revise it we're going to rework it of course but it felt like the material was really strong and I felt we really had talked about stuff that we cared about and also maybe even this could be more accessible because it had that energy of a romantic comedy of going out in the world, falling in love, uh, living your life. And then also those uh, big questions we all ask ourselves, you know, what uh, is is this the relationship I'm going to stay in for the rest of my life? What should I do with my life? All those questions that people are struggling with. So I'm so happy I had that feeling and that up till now, it seems like people are responding in that way, which is yeah. a rare thing to to experience. Well, you know, for our next question, we're gonna. It's it's really hard to engage a reader, and each of these, you know, they were scripts. They they had to prove themselves on the page, and a lot of time is spent in those first ten to fifteen pages, so that you could really draw in the reader. And I just want to hear from each of you what was important for you to accomplish in those first ten pages. So you could draw in the reader and then likewise draw in the viewer, starting with Eskel. I think the beginnings are so hard and endings are hard and and middles are hard. I mean, everything's hard in a way, but uh, I don't spend more time on the beginning than anything else. I just feel that everything should be very efficient when you write, you know, don't lose yourself in the descriptions. You had a a really wild opening. Julia's changing careers, changing herself, being indecisive, trying to find herself in her life. It, it goes really fast. Those are those are crazy first 10 minutes for any movie. We love to start a movie with sort of a, like a very generous opening with a montage that brings you in. I mean, I think sometimes it's, uh, I think about uh, Hiroshima Mon Amour, the Alain René movie that has the greatest opening of all times. It just feels like, oh, this could be cinema. It, it, it invites you in in that way. But but to be very honest here in the writer's panel, the movie in the 
in the written grip, the first didn't, didn't start like that. Uh, it had uh, like the one scene that comes a little bit later where the main character, Julie, talks to her soon-to-be boyfriend, Axel, who's a little bit older, and he tells her that the relationship they're about to start, she, he would just rather cut it off because it would uh, because he would see where it's going to lead. You know, with uh, because because of the age gap, because he's been through that before, and and he's afraid of falling in love with her and being hurt down the line, and that's exactly what happens in the movie. And that was going to be like the, the very beginning, and uh, we just moved a little bit uh, later because that was the hardest thing to write because it it really easily tipped over into mansplaining, you know. Uh, and which was a terrible thing in a movie with a, a female character. And uh, even though he was right, he was also wrong. And we really had a hard time just finding the right uh, edge. And we just thought, oh, it would be better to start with that. Just start with her trying to find her way and let that come in just a little bit later. So I'm, I'm very happy to make movies with uh, a friend that way that I can be as involved as I want. And I always feel that the last draft of a screenplay is written in the editing room. And uh, of course. I feel the, the screenwriter has a natural place there and can really add a lot. And, uh, and usually people think that the screenwriter will just be defending the ideas in the script in the editing room, but it's also true, I think, that he's or she is one of the few people who knows the whole film and the whole structure and can be genuinely creative in the editing room and, and give really good suggestions that take all the movie in consideration. And things have changed during the shoot, which is normal. So, Jane, your, your first your first 10 pages, you're opening, you're, you're doing a lot of world building. You're setting up man versus nature. You're setting up the, the ghost of Bronco Henry and, of course, your protagonists. There's, there's a lot going on there. Tell us about what was important for you in the opening of your film. You probably don't know this, but the novel begins with a description of um, Phil's genius as a castrator on the ranch. <laughs> you know, it says Phil always did the castration and then it described how he nicked them with the knife and pulled out each of the testicles and uh, we thought, like, Tanya and I and the producers, <laughs> like... This is going to be interesting. Um, are we going to do this? <laughs> um, we thought about that. I mean, there were so many obligations I felt, you know, that had to be met in setting up the story. And I didn't really think that much about um, trying to get the, you know, I don't know, Netflix or whoever who was going to read it in order to fund it to be wowed by it at the beginning because I think whatever you try to do, reads like that like if you try to wow an audience it's sad people use it incredibly purple vocabulary and 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 I, I don't like it personally I just think you have to try and honestly build um, the pathway into the heart of your story and for me I you know it was just really centered on trying to absorb all the things that were required to do and to make the story work and the main thing I felt like was to set up the fact that these two strange brothers that shared a bedroom that, you know, were like the epitome of a kind of masculinity from the ranch were going to meet this widow, soft, generous-hearted, sweet woman um, who'd lost her husband somehow and her unusual son who was making a little journal and paper flowers. And, you know, <laughs> for me it was like... This is the feminine going to meet the masculine or, and, you know, something's going to happen here. This is what's going to happen. You know, we're going to see how these themes are going to play out together. And, and we, we don't, we're never going to know until the very end how it was sorted. I, however, you know, we really, really struggled in the um, edit with the beginning. And I don't know if other people did too, but it is really very hard to get a beginning that just sits up and goes. And, um, yeah, we, we really concentrated a lot of our time on the beginning, but I didn't worry about it so much in the writing. Maybe I should have. <laughs> I, I think it's a great opening. Zach, tell us about your opening. You're, you're setting up Richard's world. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot to do, but, but obviously it's not as big of a world building because you're really setting up the sense of family 
and the destiny that he has planned for his daughters. Yeah, I mean, I think like Eskel said and, and like Jane said, I mean, I think our our opening did change a lot from you know what was originally scripted. And then when we shot, we moved, we reordered a few things, but it always began with Richard sort of as an outsider going through this pretty insane process that he had where, where he was going around to sort of the rich white tennis clubs of Los Angeles and collecting tennis balls out of the, the trash cans there. And I felt like that was, you know, could put the reader and the viewer right, right in his, in his shoes, right from the beginning and really sort of understand how an uphill climb he was going to have, you know, succeeding in this, in this idea. But I also hoped that in, in doing that, it was going to I mean, what I really wanted this movie to be was kind of like an in, independent character study, you know, that then would could be painted on the backdrop of a, you know, of a bigger of a bigger story that would maybe be more accessible. But that it, it to me, it had the bones of like of an independent film. And, and so I, I wanted to start it in a small way that that could that could let the reader know that was our intention. And I think that, you know, I, John probably has this experience as well, but like for me, as a, I'm not a director, so I know that when I'm writing scripts, they're going to be written for different readers along the way. And that, you know, the first draft of the script, I knew that it was also going to have to be a, in some ways, a sales tool to really paint the picture for the Williams family, really to say that this was, this is what we believe this film can be. And so I, I know that probably there are parts of it in that original draft that are, are like, are overridden in a way that I felt was almost intentional to knowing who the first audience for the, for that script was. And then, you know, and, and then when Ray came, Ray, the director came on board, we just began stripping back a lot of those unnecessary, maybe overridden passages that were not then necessary for actually turning that script into a film. I find the beginnings really difficult always because I think you do want to go in and sort of grab the reader or the audience by the throat a little bit, but like Jane said, it can feel like a ploy and, you know, you want to just kind of come in authentically and just say like, we just dropped you in the world of what this movie is. And, you know, hopefully you're going to keep turning the pages. John, the opening of Dune, you have a lot of heavy lifting and world building to do, but like your adaptation, what saved everything is the act of refinement from a very complicated book to really just zeroing in on the family and Paul's journey. What were some of the challenges for you in those first 10 pages, 10 minutes? The beginning of Dune as a feature was kind of a wrestling match, precisely because of the tools the novel uses to launch itself, which are unavailable to us as filmmakers. Uh, despite all the talk of Dune being a somehow unadaptable work, I think it, and in particular the first half of the novel, are very ready to be a film and deeply cinematic in their structure. There's a beautiful Greek tragedy just waiting there for you. But at the top of the novel, you begin in mid-flight. The Reverend Mother arrives to administer the test of the Gomjabar. And a boy walks down a hallway after his mother in the dark of night to meet an old crone in the library and be tortured there. And in the novel, which is an extremely interior book, we are always listening to the interior monologues of the various characters in play, not just the protagonist, but the, the baton is passed from character to character. We hear the, the rush and flow of their thoughts. And Dune is filled with scenes where people outwardly are doing little or nothing, but inwardly are having cataclysmic experiences. And we hear them strategizing, analyzing and observing. And of course, that is a deeply uncinematic way of telling a story. Outwardly, it looks like nothing. So we had to find a vernacular at the top of Dune to orient the audience. Because when you read the book, Paul's thoughts are telling you who his parents are, where they are in the world, what chain of events is lifting them from their home and taking them far away. And so we needed to invent some scenes in order to situate the reader. We tried versions that were starkly faithful to the novel, uh, but they were emotionally naked. The audience simply didn't know enough to have a feeling about anybody. And so we had to circle back and invent some scenes that were true in spirit to the book and did the work of those interior monologues in identifying this boy, his relationship to his father, his relationship to his mother, his place in the universe, to give people what they needed then to understand the rupture that he was going through. It's it's a great opening first 10 minutes. Mr. Hamaguchi, now to you. So the beginning was decided quite early on um, in writing. I think uh, the 
so the beginning is not necessarily taken from Drive My Car, the original story. Instead, its t- elements are drawn from a different short story by Haruki Murakami called Scheherazade, which is in the collection of short stories called Men Without Women. Um, and I felt that I can move the plot forward by drawing some elements from there. Um, and I think something about what you show at the beginning um, of a film, the setup, um, really dictates what kind of uh, level of reality you uh, the audience is able to accept. I think what you show first shows what uh, can dictate what an audience finds to be realistic. And so at the very beginning, you see, as you mentioned, there's um, storytelling that happens after sex. And it, in some ways, this is a very strange setup. Um, and I think I felt that if the actors can perform this situation in a convincing manner, it could actually uh, lead to the rest of the film. After all, the film itself, although there are moments where it's very much rooted in realism, there's also many parts that strays away from realism. And I felt that what I show at the beginning will pave the way for what can come afterwards. Ken, it's a blank page. You could have started it anywhere you wanted. How did you Mm. arrive at that very informative and just really gripping opening for Belfast. Well, thank you. And um, I, 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 I agree with you that um, uh, the openings are perhaps obviously enough, but they are critically important to establish uh, tone as well as everything else, not, not merely the narrative, as it were, but uh, somehow, uh, as you say, a world built. And for me, the issue of Ireland and the Troubles was one so immense in its complexity that I felt that I, as a, at the beginning, I needed to create a style that would, without patronizing or condescending um, the audience, would establish a, a relative simplicity, a simplicity that you would later understand was based on the idea of seeing the film more or less through the eyes of the nine-year-old boy at the center of it. So I needed to do something simply. One was to present modern Belfast as a vibrant, colorful city. Something sure. that you, if you have any idea of what Belfast is, and if it may be associated with the Troubles, here you are. It's a new, bustling city that might remind you of cities you know. So, so far, so familiar. Then to take people back, quite simply, so we're in Belfast now. Now we're going back to Belfast in 1969, and we're going into black and white. So we're in, we're in a world of memory. Um, and a sort of uh, there's a poetic dimension to how we're telling the story. And quickly and in shorthand, I wanted to describe um, an, another beautiful day in the neighborhood um, where the sense that it takes a village to raise a child is already clear. Uh, everybody knows each other, whether they like it or not. As Ma says later on, I like it. Uh, and we wanted to present something so secure for Buddy that in, a, in, this, in, in, in the context of a few brief moments, especially supported by an upbeat song, in this case, Van Morrison's now Oscar-nominated song, Down to Joy, about a dream of the kind of stories that he used to live in. And he comes from the streets of Belfast, played all his music on the streets of Belfast. So from the present in color to the past in black and white, to the sense of security in black and white, another beautiful day in the neighborhood, to the event upon which the film and indeed my young life turned, which was the arrival of violence in the street. And it did so through a strange, surreal moment of slowing down of time where I began to think that I was hearing bees buzzing um, very loud and as if they were in some kind of swarm. And I realized that it was not bees at all. Um, It was a group and then a larger group and then a mob of people at the bottom of the street who, before I realized in this slow motion stop of my young life, uh, were about to kick off with violence. And so a bomb was thrown, the flame started, and then all chaos was let loose. So the goal was to sort of viscerally bring the audience into this sense of Ah, here's a place we're familiar with. Ah, here's a way we're not familiar with it. Oh, it is a place of security. Oh, my God, it is not. And then both the way I spoke about it in the screenplay in terms of the images and then in the execution of those to be very uh, agitated and violent and visceral in the way the boy is grabbed out of this this, uh, riot and the way in which we uh, as an audience experience it. And I felt very much as I was writing it that, that this whole beginning from the color of modern Belfast through to 
the explosion of the car that sort of ends the um, the mob's presence in the street was one musical movement at the beginning of the script. It felt very much like a, a sort of prologue that set everything up. The family, the atmosphere of the street, the place, and the capacity for, for violence to occur at any moment. So it was. I spent as long over trying to reduce it to those things as I probably I spent on any other scene in the piece because it was so critical to establish tone. There's a lot going on and you really packed it in there quite, quite, mm -hmm. quite perfectly. So I, I love the opening. So collaboration is important for, for filmmaking and screenwriting, but there's actually times where as a writer, it's, it's important to put your foot down and to say no and, and to have the power of no, because it is still your vision and it is still something that you believe in. And Although you're all agreeable people, I'm sure you can't agree with everybody. Tell us a moment where the power of no was really important to you. And I'm curious if there was any moment where you had to enforce the power of no on Belfast. And I don't really mean in any sort of a mean-spirited way. Um, really more in a way that you had to protect your vision from it becoming diluted. I think the natural process of making films is, at least in my experience, the endless questioning of what you need and where you need it and how you need it to be done and when you need it to be done uh, is constantly trying to work out what it, what is a priority to you. That's what production often wants to know. They may have other agendas of their own, perfectly responsible and reasonable agendas just to do with, you know, finding a way to make the budget work and for everybody to know what's going on. Um, and even if that's not how you want to work at all, they somewhere, somehow, at some point, need to know that too. So I found that it's not so much a question of asserting the power of no, but but evolving a clear set of yeses, a clear set of directions that are critical to you. For me, it's often about pointing out that a scene may, in my view, require much more time to shoot than has been allocated for it because, sure. for instance, maybe there's a limited amount of dialogue. People see half a page and they say, oh, that'll, you know, that's half a morning or something on the schedule we have. And that's when you have to point out, oh, no, this is going to be involving a complicated 360 degree shot or the look of the child is so important here. And, you know, we're working with a nine-year-old, 10-year-old boy, that's going to take more than a moment, or at least we need to allow for it taking more than a moment. So, um, and that's when I suppose people can counter with, yes, but we need to do this and do that. And that's when you say, this is important to me. This is, this is the priority. So I, I think that it ends up, or at least in my experience, being the assertion of the yes, rather than the you know, resistance with the no. Sometimes there's a discussion to be had. And you may say, I know that you think scene four on page 12 is the most important, but in fact, the same theme is established in scene 19 on page 15. And that's where we've got more resources. And do you think that we might feel it more and we we wouldn't miss it earlier in the piece? And the writer will tell you fairly clearly whether they agree with that or not. So it ends up being a conversation, I think. That's a good way to phrase it. Mr. Hamaguchi? Um, so I don't necessarily have a specific example here, but I do really believe that the power of saying no is incredibly important. And I don't feel that just as a writer and director, I think as human beings, the power to be able to say no is really important because that's how we are able to foster relationships with each other. If we were always saying yes, yes to things, I don't think it's possible to actually connect with others. Um, and so what I try to do as a director is to encourage others to also say no um, as a director. I think about what also my characters might say no to and not want to do. Um, and I think as uh, I, I really try to create uh, ways and encouragement for others to say no and for myself to say no and to be able to uh, build an environment that allows for that. So John, tell us tell us a moment on Dune where the power of no was really important for you and you had to, to put your foot down on something. Well, the power of no is not a power. Uh, for a feature screenwriter, there's an art to negotiating with your creative partners about the shape of a story. You certainly don't sit in a room with Denis Villeneuve and tell him what he can't do. The only power a screenwriter has in features is the power of having the best idea. Uh, if you can reach a solution that works, if you can express your solution 
succinctly, then you can perhaps turn the direction of the project. And there are a lot of little ways um, in which I would play my corner. Um, and if I thought that what a movie needed if what, or what the audience needed, what this turn of the story needs to succeed, then I flex the only muscle a screenwriter's got, uh, which is the ability to tell a story. And so when there was a turn, when there was a shift I felt we needed to make in order to arrive with integrity at the place we were going, I would tell my little tale. I would just, it's, it's all there is. You know, it's the real politic of screenwriting, but in many ways, I think it's the best way of approaching any discord. Sure. Um, to seduce rather than compelling and to invite people to see things your way by moving and inspiring in the room in the same way you're trying to do in the story writ large. Zach, was there ever time you needed to to put your foot down to protect your story, even in the nicest way, be it to the studio or or someone else on the team? Um, I mean, I think John said it well that uh, that usually no is not the tool that that I felt like I was wielding. Um, you know, I th- felt like I knew the motions of and the sort of character turns of the story better than anyone, and so that that I felt like my job on the and I was very lucky I got to be on set every day, but that, you know, my role was just to be an advocate for, you know, this scene has to, this is what Richard has to, you know, move through in this scene to get to the next scene. And this is what, you know, I, like what Esco was saying about the editorial process, like, yeah. because I wrote the script, because I was there from the inception, I knew at least what the intentions were of why a scene in the first 15 pages was important for the end of the film. So, you know, there was, there was a sequence in our film where Richard couldn't bring himself to watch Venus's tennis match ever. So, you know, we had this sort of running theme throughout the course of the film where Richard would, when she, when Venus was playing, he was walking around. It used to be, it was very sad, but that we couldn't get it in the movie, but Richard was like a chain smoker. So he was constantly smoking menthol cigarettes. And I love that. And I thought it was going to be so cinematic and we weren't allowed to have anyone smoking in the movie, but, but anyways, you know, so there was, there was this running um, story of that, which then really pays off at the end of the movie that Richard is watching Venus's first pro match or first pro tournament. And he's has not ever been seated with her and the family. And he decides at the end of the movie to come and sit down with them. And it was this little moment, but you know, that there were times throughout the process where, where things like that might have had that were threatened to get lost just in choreography or something. And, and to be there and be able to remind, you know, this pays off. We need to make sure that this this remains. You know, I would say honestly that that more than saying no, that I found my role to be almost like a divorce lawyer or something, or like a marriage counselor. Then you have all these different people who have maybe have great ideas, but they're they're divergent or they don't all fit together. And that you're as a screenwriter, you know, as not a director, in there getting them all and saying, okay, well, I can give you this and I can give you that, but you're gonna have to you're going to have to let that idea go if you want these things to coexist. And, and so just sort of being like the advocate for the, for the script and the story throughout the process. That makes sense. So Jane, the power of no sometimes falls to a director a little more than, than, than screenwriters who are not directing. Was there, was there a time where you really had to put your foot down to protect your vision? Um, so like which part of me, the writer part, or the director part. I mean, like I'm in the lucky position actually, which I think is super important for me to have creative control of, of what I do. And I think because I have it, it makes me generous in terms of listening to my colleagues' um, feedback because you know, as I described earlier, I'm, I'm really aware that the mind can play many tricks on you. You know that I, I don't know the truth, and um, they could somehow enlighten me. Even you know, so basically, I'm really trying to understand what it is that they don't like, or they think could be improved, or it's you know not present for them, and and try to diagnose it. So I don't use the language of no because it's combative and I work with my friends and I want to value uh, their contribution. But I basically, I would say that if I don't understand what they're saying, I can't use it, you know. Um, sure. If it hits a nerve somewhere, then I'm really grateful and I kind of play around with it until I get to understand uh, better what they're pointing at. So I think feedback was something I found extremely difficult when I was younger in my career because I was so insecure that I was really just 
hanging on to my mojo by the <laughs> seat of my pants and it would really turn me into a spin if somebody gave their interpretation, uh, you know, or gave extreme feedback on what they thought it ought to happen in, you know, the second draft of a script, say, like on the piano. Um, I just couldn't take it because I said, don't don't tell me because you'll be in my head and, I'll, you know, I, I won't be able to feel my own opinions, my own thoughts. You'll block my psyche. But now I don't feel that really happens. Um, I can hear what they're saying and I can connect to myself. So it's better. But sometimes, you know, I can have arguments with people and, and agree and um, some of my producers, you know, like more be like in the mix or something, someone, you know, like we had a little argument about coming in and wanting to just have it played back. And I'm saying, like, no, that's not okay. You're like the overlord, you know. Um, you either sit with us and experience the difficulties that we're having as a colleague, um, you know, because we're not just going to play it for you by yourself, you know. Sure. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, it's a vigorous conversation, but that we're all, we're all up for that, you know. We like it. Cool. Esco, you're writing with your friend. Was there ever a time where you really needed to defend one of your ideas and say power of no, or you and Joaquin really needed to stand your ground to accomplish your vision? Well, start starting with the writing. I mean, Joachim is obviously going to direct when we're sitting there writing, but right. that doesn't mean he plays a directing card. I mean, we, we just, uh, we, we like to collaborate. And in the writer's room, it's like we have huge arguments, usually about very uh, stupid small things, but we, uh, we, we, we're really passionate. I mean, I think passionate people make movies. So sometimes you argue, uh, and, uh, but you do it with respect for the other person. And, uh, often when we think back at the argument, we can't really remember which side we were on, you know, because we're so intertwined in that, uh, writing process. But, um, we usually think that it's the best idea that will triumph and if i don't like an idea joachim throws at me or vice versa we'll find a third one that we both like and that's better and after we've written we know that joachim has creative control he has final cut so that's not a discussion uh, you know with the producers and 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 everything but what's often especially when you make movies in norway where the budgets aren't huge you you have that moment probably a month before shoot where they say we don't have all the money what are we going to cut and that's when i think uh, sometimes it's good for you akim to have me as well that we can as a team i mean that that's what we do well i mean we use words but we also understand the whole movie so when some people will suggest a cut we can very easily explain why that shouldn't be cut. And then we can go back and say, maybe we should cut that thing. <laughs> uh, and then we do it because we want to, you know? Uh, and, and so my job after we finished writing is to help protect the director's vision because that's also my vision. And I think, uh, and the part of movie making that happens on set, I'm, I'm a director myself, so I know uh, how important that process is and how important the collaboration of everyone else is. And I've been on set on Joachim's films, but I, I started to compare it to being like a father present at childbirth, <laughs> that you are, you really invested. It's so important to you, but you have no function and you're just in the way of all the doctors walking around and you're tripping over like wires and everything. So <laughs> right. uh, uh, this moment, and I just think that I, I have a better use of my time is to work on my own projects or maybe to keep a fresh eye when he's in editing. Sure. And then, uh, and then in editing, it's not like we're equal. I mean, then Joachim will have the final say of the of the cut. But I feel that my job there is just to say, no, you can't do that, or you should do that, and, and I want to be heard. And then sometimes he listen to me, sometimes not. But it just feels good to be heard in that process. And and Joachim, I think also like uh, Jane said, since he has creative control. He is very, very attentive. He listens to people. He's very open to ideas. And it just makes for a better process for everyone because it's not fear driven. You, you're Absolutely. not afraid of losing your vision. And so it's important I've, during editing to have those fresh eyes. So, so I think so. Yeah. Makes sense. And, and not just to surround yourself with people who say that you're a genius and everything is amazing, uh, which I which I 
probably don't say enough to Joachim, you know, because he is amazing. But uh, I, I kind of concentrate on the, on the, on what's not working and what I want to be different, what do I uh, want to mean uh, slightly uh, another thing, and all those things. But uh, it's Fair a collaborative enough. effort. Yeah. Ooh, hey, I'm jumping in really quick to tell you to check out the Oscar issue of Backstory Magazine, folks. It is live, and you could read all of the screenplays from today's panel, including all of the nominees and even the contenders. Our Oscar issue number 46 is packed with great content, interviews with Oscar nominees, including some of the fine folks from this panel that are completely different from the questions that you are hearing in this panel. And the cool thing about our Oscar issue is since we're a digital magazine we are going to keep adding non-Oscar stories after the Oscars are over so we're going to keep adding content to our Oscar issue until it's time to publish our next issue and really there's a lot to explore in Backstory Magazine if you've never read us before you could read Backstory on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app Backstory and of course you could test drive us by reading our free issue and if you like what you read and I hope you do I hope you'll consider becoming a subscriber and if you want to subscribe you could use coupon code SAVE5, and that will save you $5 off a one-year subscription to Backstory Magazine. So look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, which is where all these Zoom interviews go, including today's episode, by the way. It would mean a lot to me to have you support my passion project. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. Of course, while you're surfing around online, folks, I hope you'll stop by our sponsors' websites. That's finaldraft.com and Coverfly.com. As I would hope you know, Final Draft is the maker of the world's premier screenwriting software, Final Draft 12. And if you would like to get an upgrade or make a purchase, I have a coupon code for you folks that will save you 40%. That's code QAPOD22. The code again is QAPOD22. And that will save you 40% off a purchase or upgrade for Final Draft 12. So get in there, folks. That's a great deal. Now, when you finish writing that screenplay, you got to do something with it. So I suggest you go take a look at our other sponsor's website, Coverfly.com. Coverfly.com is a great resource for helping connect screenplays and writers to industry professionals. In fact, hundreds of writers who've used Coverfly have found their agent or their manager and gone on to work with studios such as Universal, Netflix, CBS, Amazon, and Blumhouse. If you're an emerging screenwriter with a finished script, go check out coverfly.com. And folks, I have a little treat for you. We have a bonus question and two of our guests answered it. It's Mr. Brano and Mr. Hamaguchi. So as we return to our Q&A, we're going to start with the bonus question that those two guests answered, and then we're going to go back into our group question format. So here we go. The question was in regards to the fact that we love our pals at LA Film School, and we were curious what advice these filmmakers have for graduating film students ready to go off and become filmmakers in their own right. It's always, I think, to A, practice, just keep any and every opportunity you get to practice and to do is important. So just keep making in the small and the large. If you write, write. If you direct, direct any which way you can. Keep doing that. And in so doing, keep trying to find your voice. When I made my first film, um, and I was sometimes hampered by a concern that I wasn't technically um, skilled enough. Um, I'd been on many sets as an actor, but I was still pretty young. I was 27 when I directed my first film. And... Um, one thing that some of my key collaborators, the first assistant, David Tringham, who'd been an assistant on Lawrence of Arabia, uh, Ken McMillan, the cinematographer who I'd worked with on Pat O'Connor's film A Month in the Country, both said to me regularly, you know, for all the technical stuff, you can ask and please, please say, and I learned to do it very soon on my first film, uh, the most useful phrase, I don't know. Say it quickly when it's true, because you'll get some help. But what they couldn't help me with and what they wanted and why they had joined was to hear my voice, my way of telling the story of Henry V. Um, that was the unique and original thing to be listened to. So for new students, I'd say, keep doing it, keep practicing. Don't worry about your age, you know, just get on with it. But but also get on with with, with understanding that everyone is different and your voice, your unique view of the world and your unique view of storytelling 
however it's developed, is what will draw people to your film, your story, your script or whatever. So believing in that, not believing that there is a mystery that must be found by sitting at the feet of the masters. That's a perfect answer. Thanks, Mr. Hamaguchi. まあ、自分がもらったアドバイス、えー、これは黒沢清監督からのアドバイスで。In terms of what pieces of advice I personally got,、um, I'd like to mention、uh, my mentor, Kiyoshi Kurosawa, the filmmaker.、Um, and one of the things that he says regarding script writing is that if you ever find yourself writing dialogue that is more than three lines long, then you should question yourself because that's actually not how most people. Talk. But the thing is, with a lot of my films, I end up writing a lot of dialogue that goes over that.、Um, but I do, I do so now with the understanding that what I'm doing is quite strange.、Um, and then the other part of this is、um, if there is an incident that, that happens in、uh, your film, think about what the police would do, how the police would act according to that. And that reason being that that could lead to you thinking about how society might view that incident.、Um, and if you don't think About how society is moving or how the police might react to certain incidents.、Um, you're not necessarily thinking about society itself, and it really allows for you to bring in、uh, the weight of reality into the storytelling. And, and that advice, I think, has been very helpful for me. That's fascinating. Thanks. So, Eskel, starting with you, you know, I just, you are the only people that would be able to tell us this because we've all seen your movies and studied them and love them. What was a happy accident? That either happened on the page that ch- turned the course of your story that you're really happy about, all the planning couldn't have accommodated it, it just kind of sparked, or it was something that happened on set as a happy accident, either or. I, I have to say that、uh, what's the best thing of being a screenwriter is when you have just amazing actors、uh, saying your words and,、uh, and making them alive. And I, I remember with There's both Renat、uh, r e i n s v e r and、uh, Anders Danielsen Lee,、uh, who I worked with several times before, and,、uh, and Herbert Nordrum was the first time. But the, those three, I mean, sometimes they would say something and it would just feel, and I would say, oh, that's a great improvisation. And it was exactly what I've written. It just felt so fresh. And sometimes, because Joachim likes to keep things loose, they would improvise something. Sure. And, then, and then add that to the text and, and intertwine it because it's very hard for actors to just make up lines. They, they tend to fall back into what's written but,、uh, because,、uh, I mean, it's hard to make up good stuff、uh, <laughs> for like a minute at a time. So they, they come back to the text and sometimes they would just put a little spin on it, you know, and, and, and add some great lines that I'm very happy to take credit for afterwards. But that's,、uh, right. that's really. Uh, a wonderful thing to witness when you have that kind of talent, uh, just uh, making your characters alive. I mean, one of the scenes that we wrote that we were most happy with was、uh, a scene quite early in the movie. It,、uh, the movie's in chapters, so the chapter is called Cheating, and there's two people who meet at the party, and they are both are in a relationship, so they feel attracted to each other and say, We're not going to cheat. So, and, and what's really the limit of cheating? And they start to test those limits and it,、uh, and it read w- really well. But then to make that, you really have to have a chemistry that you can't write. You know? and, and those two actors had that and it really lifted the scene to another level. Great. Jane, what was a happy accident on Power of the Dog or, or a moment on the page where something surprised you, even with all of your pre planning and outlining? and Possibly treatment writing and reading the book. Actually, it's a scene with no dialogue on it, where I guess I don't know if it was about writing it, but it was at least about making space for it in the film. And I think for me, the most exciting things are things I've got no control on, the things that happen、um, because I was working with Benedict Cumberbatch and he has, he's been bred to act basically, both his parents are actors and they created this wonderkind who can <laughs> access his emotions in these most. Extraordinary ways, and、um, just to be with him and Ari, the cinematographer, alone, having to shoot off the rest of the crew, and seeing Benedict go to these sort of samurai kind of deep grief places, remembering his lover Bronco Henry, 
and um, not knowing what Benedict was going to do next. You know, we had seen a little bit of what he might do in rehearsal, but, you know, things went way, way, way beyond that. And <laughs> Ari and I were sort of lying in the grass together next to each other, you know, watching him and kind of just whispering, could you do that again? <laughs> there was just so much intimacy and he took us into a place where I'd, I really never thought I would feel or be and um, I remember you know kind of coming out of that little cathedral that little church of green you know and um, just feeling a sense of real amazement and gratitude to have experienced that moment you know whether you know whatever the whatever happened to the film I had that moment you know yeah so there was, um, yeah, it was really created out of both Ari's sort of capacity to sink in with Benedict and, you know, us all having an understanding of, you know, what Bronco Henry might mean and that we were going to explore it. Yeah. Great. Zach? Yeah, I mean, I would start with the same place. I think that the actors on this and, you know, for me, it was a really new experience to get to see what happens when you have really talented people reading and inhabiting those roles. But, you know, Will is really an incredible improviser. So he was just, you know, if, if, if it was a little thing at the end of a scene that just really made it, turned it in a way that he, he would throw in there. Um, and that him and really him and John Barenthal and Anjanu had this incredible you know, chemistry together or in their scenes together where, you know, they'd just throw in something slightly unexpected that would, that would really turn the intention of the scene in a, in a really exciting way. But then in terms of a real sort of mistake, the only time I, the, I really remember something kind of going wrong on the set was we, there's a big scene in the film where, where Richard and Orsine, Will and Anjanu have a large fight in the kitchen when like a lot of their laundry is aired between each other. And that was a really long, intense shoot. And at the very end of that day, we were supposed to shoot what had been one of my favorite scenes in the script, which was when Serena really comes out to Richard and is frustrated about that she has been left behind in, in the process of Venus's escalation. And I had early on in the research, I had read this story where Richard had told her essentially that like this prophecy that he had said that Venus would be number one in the world, but Serena would be the greatest of all time. And I was this, it was, you know, it was a really powerful in the script and they, we shot it like at the end of that kitchen scene day. And I mean, Ray would say this as well. Like they just like, didn't get it. It was, it was really rushed. And it was the only time on set the whole time where I went up to Ray. I'm like, I don't, I'm like, I don't think you got that. <laughs> and then, you know, he was like, yeah, we didn't. And, and so what we ended up doing it, that scene was initially staged in the house and we, and it was in a different place in the script, in the story. And we decided to reshoot it and then placed it later in the film, later in the narrative. And it became Serena in the threshold of this stadium, looking at an empty court. And it just, it placing it there gave it just the, they, there was much less that had to be said because yeah. it was all in the, it was all in the visuals and it was really powerful. Right. And, and, and it's amazing that it wasn't scripted that way, but it ended up being just a completely memorable moment in the film as well oh. and visually supported. John? Well, the thing about having a co-writer in Denis Villeneuve is that you can be surprised by somebody else's insight or little act of genius. One of the more intractable problems in writing Dune is that its hero, Paul, uh, is a clairvoyant and he has visions that show him the future. But the future, as envisioned by Frank Herbert, is not a road you walk down, but more like a river constantly overflowing its banks and cutting new courses. It's in constant motion. And in fact, the very act of glimpse in the future changes it. It melts and shifts away from you. And good luck expressing that cinematically. Uh, and so we grappled with that a lot, to how to show the audience what Paul was seeing and how what it meant to see the future, not knowing whether the future would come to pass, but to rather to see a cloud of possible futures. And it was Denis who finally struck upon the notion of essentially letting Paul strike up a friendship in a future that never comes to pass with a man that in the film's timeline, he is forced to kill. And so this man he unwillingly kills in a duel of honor at the end of the film becomes his friend and his teacher in a future that is cut off and never comes to be. But because of his gift, he's lived that future and he remembers it. And he has a friend inside him to guide him through moments 
um, that never came to be for anyone but Paul. And I think that's very beautiful poetry. And, you know, we had wrestled quite a bit with how to approach these visions. You don't want to lay down a bunch of dry sci-fi rules about how psychic vision works. You want to allow its poetry and its mystery. And so we were trying to say as little about it as we could. And it was Denis who came to that idea, which I think is very powerful and beautiful and nowhere in the novel. That's just Denis Villeneuve. And it was an amazing moment because it's happening in the middle of the sandstorm with the way it was edited in. Mm -hmm. And you, you now think Jamie's is going to be a mentor to him so that when we meet him, we see him with friendly eyes and it totally shows that Paul's visions can change That's right. um, and can deceive him, which is very important for that book and series. So that's, that's a, that's a great happy accident. And now Mr. Hamaguchi, your answer. <laughs> 幸福な偶然っていうのはとても大事なものだっていうふうに思っている。偶然っていうものは、まあ、特にその撮影において捉える。You know, in terms of happy accidents, accidents and coincidences, both of these things are very important to me.、Um, I think coincidences are a very important part of shooting a film. But that, that said, whether there were specific examples of coincidences that in fact changed the direction of the plot of the story, there wasn't so much. However, I am very grateful to the many coincidences that did happen to drive my car.、Um, a lot of them had to do with the weather.、Um, in the shooting schedule didn't have very much leeway. We didn't have very many backup dates. So we knew that whatever the weather was, we probably had to shoot that scene. But、um, when I really wanted the scene to be sunny,、uh, we, were, we found that it was a sunny day to shoot. Um, for example, the rehearsal scene in the park, I really wanted that to be sunny and it ended up being sunny. And I was really grateful for that. On a, a scene day when we wanted snow, it was also snowing. So I was really grateful for that. There's also a time where、um, we were shooting the scenes where they were driving through tunnels.、Um, there, there was a moment where it was raining when they came out of the tunnel. And that was really coincidental too. But I felt that this change in environment that was depicted through that really、uh, did. Showed and expressed a sense of transport that happens through the through going through the tunnels. So I'm really grateful for the many coincidences that really allowed for this film to happen. Mr. Rana, your answer. Well, one happy accident was shooting when we did, which was in the summer. We weren't sure when we could finally, perhaps via COVID, have the opportunity to shoot. But one of the things that it did、uh, was. And in the location that we found for most of what we were doing, it gave us a chance to have a lot of variety. So there's a couple of scenes, for instance, where, where Buddy's on his way to school. And we found a place that next to our school had a, a, a sort of wheat field, a grass field that felt like it was a, sort of something out of days, days of Heaven or something, or at least that's how, I, that's how I referenced it. It may not remotely seem that way to other people. And so I was able to very clearly. Um, in little transitional scenes, show that Buddy, despite living in his very urban environment, city environment,、uh, would, as I did myself, walk to, walk to school via a park, which seemed like a savannah to me. It seemed so incredible. And when I was scouting Belfast, I, I, I walked all the same streets and I walked my route from school again through this park, which, of course, is like a handkerchief of a park um, um, now that I'm a slightly bigger guy, et cetera. Um, but then it was critical to, as a decompression chamber for me. So, having sunshine in order to be able to build that kind of picture up of the variety of the landscapes in my you know, vivid imagination was important. And also, frankly, to be shooting in the summer, because 1969 was the summer of love over in San Francisco, et cetera.、Uh, the, the day that our film starts, August the 15th, 1969, was the first day of the Woodstock Music Festival. There was something about heat and what heat does. You mentioned Romeo and Juliet earlier on as a play that, like so many, that, that has behavior very much affected by the weather. And so the hot summer of 69 was in no small measure. Um, a contributory factor to the way that violence spilled out onto the streets of Belfast. So that we were able to reflect that in the film, felt it, it somehow gave a degree of authenticity, which frankly you don't always get because Belfast weather can be notoriously unreliable. And you can certainly get winter in July and winter in August. But in this case, we got, we got August in August and September in September. And、uh, those specific、um, weather corollaries were, were very. Lucky for us and for the film, in terms of just building up this sort of、uh, seething heat. Because a film that was influential on this, it may seem odd,、uh, it was Do the Right Thing. 
great film from Spike Lee. Of course, the sense of community, the sense of yeah. the neighborhood turning yeah, and the upside heat. down. And right? the heat. And the heat, yeah. That makes sense. Well, that that is a good happy accident. So I know we're running out of time. This is, it's it's been great hearing all of your answers. This is the 14th year that I've been doing this panel with Oscar screenwriting nominees. And this is the 14th time that I've asked this question. And it is a silly question. So I want you to know that you, um, <laughs> you're you you're under no obligation to answer honestly. But if you would like to, as a fan, give an honest answer, you can. You could give a silly answer. Or if you're not in the mood to give an answer, you could take the fifth. So here is the question. As we all know, um, it's very common in the film industry to hire writers on as rewriters. If you were hired on as a rewriter for any of the other Oscar-dominated films, what is a scene or a moment that you would add, Mr. Branagh? What's something that you would change? You could take the fifth. You could make a joke of it. Or you could be a serious fan and talk about a scene that you would have loved to have seen. My experience of occasionally being a producer on other people's films is that I have an innate desire to serve and enable whatever it is they want and need to do. So I feel that the job is to ask questions, perhaps, that from a creative point of view, that um, try to understand how to make the thing they want it to be more of what it is. And in my experience, it never, it would never result in asking somebody to change things. They, they always become questions about what people intended. And if in that intention, I have fully understood it, or if I haven't, then uh, are they frustrated by that? Or they're happy with that? Or they think, oh, you didn't understand that? Oh, I need to do X or Y. But for me, the magic, and I feel this the other way around, is when anybody rewriting, coming in, suggesting anything, is trying to understand how to make the thing that you are making more of what it is. So that can be quite a fun journey. But for me, in my experience, it's a respectful one. And frankly, it's not, uh, I, I don't ever, I don't see it as useful to try and change anything but I see it as valuable sometimes to try and understand exactly what it is someone wants if they have a clear view of that. And they may not want a clear view of that. So to sure. me, it gets back to this thing of an open conversation. Otherwise, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare. I wouldn't dare oh. change anything. I just would only, I would only want to know whether they've got it exactly how they'd like it. That's fair enough. That's a good answer. That, that plays. Mr. Hamaguchi, your answer. <laughs> <laughs> so it's an incredibly difficult question to answer. Um, and I apologize for giving somewhat of a stereotypically Japanese answer here. But I think at the end of the day, I, I don't think there's anything I could change. I think everybody has their own way of creating. And if I were to somehow rewrite something that I think it would just end up being a very different film and would not be the films that are being nominated today. Starting with you, John. Well, I think that if I were going to write a movie called The Power of the Dog, that dog could have much more impressive powers. I mean, honestly, this dude, he's chomping a hill. How, what is that really? I think there's, there's, there's laser eyes, always yes. perennially underrated. There's the power of flight, power to change into animals better than a dog. Uh, these are just some of the powers I'm thinking of right now. And I just got started. There could be a lot of powers for the dog. Uh, Zach. I don't know. I would say, <laughs> yeah, school's movie. I don't know. I'd probably just rewrite the whole thing. Um, <laughs> no, no, I told Esco, I love his movie so much. Um, I, I, this is such a cop out, but I really thought that the writing in all these movies was amazing. And Dune, I was so, I was so surprised at how intimate the story of Dune was, on, I don't, I've never read the book, but just that you were able to, to keep that. That's really that the core of that story between it was just the son and his mom at the end of the movie. And it was, it, but it played on this enormous backdrop. And I thought, you know, I think the expectation of a movie like that is that you're going to build to this enormous finale. That's going to, you know, that is going to be this huge battle. And it's su such an intimate character moment between those two things. So Sorry, that's a total bullshit answer, but I, <laughs> it's it's acceptable. Jane, what what's what's your answer? And uh, I will accept for you if you have something about Bronco Henry that you want to tell us as 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 a magical scene that could have been added. But otherwise, what what would you have rewritten on one of these other films first? I think on Zach's film, I would have written a scene when Serena 
was sent over to teach Jane Campion tennis. Nice. <laughs> Because I actually do often joke about like, can't why can't Will Smith come over and help me learn to play tennis? Because where I'm staying in Hollywood right now, I've got a tennis court, and I'm dying to have some lessons. I think I think you might get lessons out of this. Yeah, we can send someone over there, Jay. Yeah, I I, I think I could be good. A skill. Oh, this is so hard, and you guys been so funny. Uh, uh, I would I would never touch any movie, Jane. Uh, that's because she's a genius and uh, I love her movies so I uh, I wouldn't dare but but maybe those supernatural powers the dog uh, the jungle of the dog would would add something yeah that's possible uh, no, I, I'm just uh, I mean yeah <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's a sequel. <laughs> the dog really takes over. Yeah. And, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just full of respect for the, my uh, fellow uh, nominees here. And uh, June for me was, uh, I was uh, shocked that you could make like a, a big, huge budget science fiction movie like that. That's so dreamlike. I mean, for me, it's like the whole movie are visions and dreams and, uh, and really, uh, that's I, that's very rare to see. I mean, uh, and uh, at any time in film history, and especially now on the big screen. And uh, I really, I really love the story of King Richard, and and especially what I wouldn't change is where Zach decided to end that story with that specific match and that moment. And I just Absolutely. admired the, the the craft of that. So I, uh, but I think every movie could be better with supernatural powers. Yes. So that's probably uh, yeah. Then Dune Dune has that, so it can't be uh, it can't be improved. But uh, we, yeah, we agree. If if, yeah. if there was a supernatural <laughs> dog that was able to fight Bronco Henry, that would be the sequel for Power. <laughs> and and they, and they could play tennis with yes. Will Smith and Jane Campion. That would be <laughs> yes. the perfect film. I would I would watch the hell out of that movie too. <laughs> Look, you 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 all your 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 screenplays have inspired the world. Congrats on your Oscar nomination for each of them. Thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wish I was with you all. Yeah, I know. Drink afterwards. I'm so stimulated by what everyone's been saying. And that's how the 14th annual screenwriting nominees Q and A went down. Special thanks again to this amazing panel, which includes Sir Kenneth Brano, Ryosuke Hamaguchi, John Spates, Zach Balin. Jane Campion, and Eskel Fucht. I really appreciated each of them joining this conversation and kudos to all of them again on their Oscar nominations for screenwriting. Of course, I want to thank the studio and personal publicist who helped make this event possible. There was a lot to coordinate behind the scenes and they worked really hard and it meant a lot to me. So thanks again to the studio publicist and personal publicist for helping make this event happen as well. I miss all my friends at the Los Angeles Film School. It's now been two years since our last in-person Q&A screening, and it was really cool to work with them as they helped spotlight and moderate behind the scenes of our group Zoom, so everything went smoothly in our group chat. Thanks again to the LA Film School for all their help, and I hope to be back soon. Of course, I also want to thank our sponsors, Final Draft over at FinalDraft.com and Coverfly. You know, first you could write your script in Final Draft, which is the world's premier screenwriting software, and then you could get Coverfly to help connect you and your script to industry professionals. And one other thing about Final Draft, if you're looking to purchase Final Draft 12 or upgrade to Final Draft 12, you could use discount coupon code QAPOD22 at the finaldraft.com website, and that will save you 40% off your purchase or upgrade. It's a hell of a deal, folks. So I hope you take advantage of it, write the script of your dreams, and then go to coverfly.com to get them involved to help you get it out there. Of course, while you're surfing around online, I hope you check out Backstory Magazine. We just published our Oscar issue. We have all the scripts of all the Oscar-nominated screenplays inside in their entirety, waiting for you to read them. And it also includes a bunch of the Oscar contenders. So folks, there is a lot to read in the new issue. Of course, there's interviews with great writers and directors and editors and camera people as well in this issue. There's a lot to read. And just so you know, the screenwriting questions that we asked are completely different from things that we discussed in today's podcast. 
So there is even more for you to explore with these Oscar nominated films in the pages of Backstory magazine. And, you know, once the Oscars are over, remember, check out the table of contents at Backstory.net because we keep updating our magazine with new content from the film and TV shows that we love in between issues. And since we're a digital magazine, it's easy to slide a new article into our magazine and then our table of contents as well. As I hope you know, Backstory can be read on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app backstory. And if you've never read us before, I hope you'll test drive us and read the free issue. And if you like what you see, I hope you'll consider becoming a subscriber. And if you want to subscribe, you could use coupon code SAVE5 to save $5 off a one-year subscription to Backstory Magazine. Look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners in iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, which is where all these Zoom interviews go including today's, by the way, you could watch all of us having our chat together, but it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners support my passion project. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber to Backstory Magazine. The Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith podcast is a copyright of Unlikely Films Incorporated in 2022. All rights reserved. Folks, if you want to find me on social media, I'm Yo Goldsmith on Twitter or Backstory underscore Mag on Twitter. You could also find me on Instagram with those same handles, Yo Goldsmith on Instagram or Backstory underscore Mag on Instagram. And you know, you could also email me using backstoryletters at gmail.com. And that inbox gets a little crowded sometimes, but I go through it. I love hearing from people. So it's always fine to drop me a line because I like responding when I can. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of Backstory Mag and the host of the Q&A, thanking you for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble. Till next week.